Good morning, everybody. Welcome to St. Stephen's online service for Sunday, the 19th of July. Let us open in prayer. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. How unsearchable your judgments and your paths beyond tracing out. Praise the Lord, O my soul, all my inmost being. Praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed, he remembers that we are dust. Lord, we thank you for your mercy and your grace, that you, not de you do not treat us the way we deserve, that you call us into your presence to worship you this morning. We ask your blessing on this service. Amen. The Apostle Paul, towards the end of his life, wrote three letters to two of his close associates whom he sent to minister to specific churches. The messages were, however, not meant exclusively for the pastors, but also as godly instruction for their congregants. We live in seriously uncertain times. This COVID-19 thing affects all of us in different ways, not least of which is our financial position. With retrenchments, businesses closing, reduced wages, and the general collapse of the things which we got used to rely on. In the light of all this, I want to draw your attention to how Paul dealt with the issue of our attitudes to our material possessions from 1 Timothy 6. I've taken this from John Stott, the Bible Speaks Today series, the message of 1 Timothy and Titus. Firstly, in verse 6 to 8, he deals with what we may call the contented poor. But godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into the world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Paul is not in any way propagating being destitute. He simply points out that material possessions have no meaning for eternity. When we die, we leave everything behind. We need food, clothing, and shelter, but we should in everything seek first the kingdom of God. The Lausanne Committee for World Evangelization in March 1980 formulated a commitment to a simple lifestyle as follows. We resolve to renounce waste and oppose extravagance in personal living, clothing and housing, travel and church buildings. We also accept the distinction between necessities and luxuries, creative hobbies and empty status symbols, modesty and vanity, occasional celebrations and normal routine, and between the service to God and slavery to fashion. Where to draw the line requires conscientious thought and decision by us together with the members of our families. Paul then deals in verses 9 and 10 with what we may call the covetous poor. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and the trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people evil for eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. There are many examples in the Bible of the disastrous effects of covetousness. Adam and Eve, Achan, Judas, and Ananias and Sapphira all came to, came to grief through different kinds of covetousness. Paul concentrates on only two evils which spring from covetousness. First, some people eager for money have worship, wandered from the faith. It is not possible to pursue truth and money, God and mammon, at simultaneously. People either renounce avarice in their commitment to the faith, or they make money their God and depart from the faith. Secondly, they have pierced themselves with many griefs. Paul doesn't elaborate, but these griefs could include worry and remorse, the pangs of a disregarded conscience, the discovery that materialism can never satisfy the human spirit, and final despair. To summarize, Paul does not expect us to live in destitution, but to live with a simplicity of lifestyle, which is entirely compatible with human dignity. We are called to co combine 
personal contentment with the quest for justice, especially if it is justice for other people that we contend for. In a word, he is not for poverty against wealth, but for contentment against covetousness. Paul, however, also addresses the rich. In verses 17 to 19 we read, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, not to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. He does not only warn against the dangers of being rich, that of arrogance and the false sense of security, but also reminds them of the duties of wealth, being responsible and having a sense of proportion. Bringing together Paul's negative and positive instructions to the wealthy, they are not to be proud and despise the poor, but to do good and be generous. They are not to fix their hopes on uncertain riches, but on God the giver and on that most valuable of all his gifts, the treasure of eternal life. Looking over both these passages about money, the Apostle's balanced wisdom becomes apparent. Against materialism and obsession with material possessions, he said simplicity of lifestyle. Against asceticism, the repudiation of the material order, he sets gratitude for God's creation. Against covetousness, the lust for more possessions, he sets contentment with what we have. Against selfishness, the accumulation of goods for ourselves, he sets generosity in imitation of God. Simplicity, gratitude, contentment and generosity constitute a healthy quadrilateral of Christian living. reading this morning is from Job chapter 38. We'll be reading from verses 1 to 24. Then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind. He said, Who is this who obscures my counsel with ignorant words? Get ready to answer me like a man. When I question you, you will inform me. Where were you when I established the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. 
Who fixed its dimensions? Certainly you know. Who stretched the measuring line across it? What supports its foundations? Or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? Who enclosed the sea behind doors when it burst from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and total darkness its blanket? When I determined its boundaries and put its bars and doors in place? When I declared, you may come this far but no farther, your proud waves stop here? Have you ever in your life commanded the morning or assigned the dawn its place, so it may seize the edges of the earth and shake the wicked out of it? The earth is changed as clay is by a seal. Its hills stand out like the folds of a garment. Light is withheld from the wicked, and the arm raised in violence is broken. Have you travelled to the sources of the sea or walked in the depths of the oceans? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the extent of the earth? Tell me if you know all this. Where is the road to the home of light? Do you know where darkness lives, so you can lead it back to its border? Are you familiar with the path to its home? Don't you know? You are already born. You have lived so long. Have you entered the place where the snow is stored? Or have you seen the storehouses of hail, which are held in reserve for times of trouble, for the day of warfare and battle? What road leads to the place where light is dispersed? Where is the source of the east wind that spreads across the earth? This is the word of the Lord.
Let us pray. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. Dear Lord, there is none like you. You are our God and you are our King. And we stand righteous before your throne because of what our Saviour, our Lord Jesus Christ, has done for us. And yet we confess that we have not loved you with our whole hearts and minds. In fact, we easily go astray. Forgive us, we pray, and cleanse us through your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you. O oh Lord, I call to you. Come quickly to me. Hear my voice when I call to you. May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. Set a guard over my mouth, O Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Let not my heart be drawn to what is evil. But, Lord, help my eyes to be fixed on you. For you are my God and you are my King. O oh Lord, we pray for our country. We pray for wisdom and strength for our president. We think of the nurses and the doctors in this pandemic that you would protect them. They would not get ill and that you'd help them to be gracious in their service to those who are not well. We pray for all who have lost loved ones and there are many. We pray that you would comfort them in this time of loss. We think of all those that are involved in any way in the emergency services. We pray, Lord, that you would be with them. We think also, Lord, of those in our own congregation that are in need. We pray that you'd help those amongst us who are struggling in any way, strengthen each one of us in our walk with you. We also give you great thanks, Lord, for all the good gifts you give us, for all that you have done for us, for our church family, for our homes, for everything that you have given us. And we pray, Lord, that you'd use the gifts given to our church for the glory and the honor of your name. Pray for Cara and Jeremy. Be with them now. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, but all the sons of God shouted for joy. Those are just the first seven verses of the passage we read this morning. How do we describe God? One of the church fathers, Augustine, suggested that there are really three methods to describe God's attributes. The one, known as the via negativa, or the way of negation, is to define something by saying what it isn't. It's probably the easiest way that we can define God. So we have those attributes that define God by negation. God is infinite, for example. He's not finite. We are finite, but God is infinite. We have boundaries. There's an edge or limit to where we live and move and have our being. He is not finite. He is infinite. He doesn't need those boundaries. We may probe space, but we cannot reach the end of God. Another attribute is his immutability. Everyone has changed. Even our bodies change on a minute-by-minute -minute basis. Apparently, skin tissues regenerated every two weeks. Bones are regenerated every ten years. But God, he remains the same. The defining attribute of all created things is that they change, but God doesn't. Then there's also the via eminentia, which is to take normal human attributes and to extrapolate them. 
the capacity to learn, for example, and to gather knowledge, accumulate knowledge, is a human condition. But God is omniscient. He knows all things. Our capacity to develop power, particularly in the last couple of centuries with nuclear technology, space travel, and different political systems, and yet God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. Then there is the via affirmitas, which is to take the extreme edges of our ability to comprehend who God is, to affirm who he is, not in terms of what he isn't. And the most important attribute there is what used to be known as the aseity of God, but it means the self-sufficiency of God. Now I can understand if at this point people who hear this say, no, you're beginning to lose me now. I certainly I understand the via uh, negativa and the via eminentia, but this, this is difficult to understand. And that's because the general knowledge and understanding of God, whether Christian or not, is certainly absent from society in our secular states and in our current situation where really lack of knowledge of God is paramount. Understanding the self-sufficiency of God is very difficult. But let's consider it for a moment as something that is indicative of that passage we read and another one I will look at in Isaiah. This is the most powerful of all the attributes, albeit difficult to understand. It stretches us so much to understand this attribute, a satiety. This means God's self-existence. We don't have self-existence. Our existence depends on Him. But He has self-existence. He has the power of being in and of itself. Eternally, He is. You remember the burning bush? You remember that theophany? where Moses is exposed to God and God tells him to take his shoes off because he's standing on holy ground. It is there where God declares his aseity. I am that I am. Yahweh. There's no other religion that has come up with a, com a concept that is so profound as that. Another passage we're going to be looking at is one in Isaiah where God speaks to Cyrus, the Persian king. But here's the interesting thing. When he speaks through the prophet, Cyrus isn't even born yet. He says to Cyrus, I am the Lord, there is no other. Now there's a book that has been written about the holiness of God. And it begins to touch on these kinds of attributes. That book is R.C. Sproul's Holiness of God. I would heartily recommend it, The Holiness of God. It's one of the great books written by R.C. Sproul. And in fact, I owe a lot of the sermon to one of R.C. Sproul's sermons. Thomas Aquinas, who was another one of the Church Fathers, spoke of the five great proofs of God's existence. And one of them is that God is the Enza Necessarium. That is, He's the necessary being. He's the necessary being for everything we have around us. Now let me explain that in terms of what current thinking is, just to explain its opposite. The current thinking is, is that everything we see around us came into being from nothing. Yes, you heard it right. People who are supposedly very intelligent, with many degrees, studying at the most amazing institutions, are suggesting that everything came into being from nothing. In the words of Malcolm Muggeridge, one of the great Christian apologists of the last century, they've educated themselves into imbecility. But that's how far people will go 
to avoid the truth. This notion of God's self-sufficiency, as well as the notion of God's holiness, is completely lost in our day. That his being is logically necessary. It's why we exist. That is because of his eternal being. We cannot claim any logical necessity for our existence apart from that. In order to do so, we have to take leave of reason. We have to stop thinking logically and rather resort to the notion that the universe came into being from nothing. As God speaks to Cyrus via Isaiah the prophet, he says, That they may know me, no, sorry, from the rising of the sun to its setting, that there is none besides me. I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things, Isaiah 45, 6-7. Now, what's quite interesting is that the King James Version has a poor translation here. and Many people who uh, adhere to the King James Version get confused. That verse 7, which starts off with, I form the light and create darkness, the King James Version is rendered, I create evil. The word the Hebrew word there for darkness can mean anything ranging from moral evil to bad food. So clearly there was a misunderstanding of its intent. There's also the notion of parallelism here, which is a particular poetical form where there is a contrast drawn between entities and it is used here. And the original translators of the King James, drawn from the Textus Receptus, but clearly without an understanding of the Hebrew intent, didn't translate it well. But it still says, I create calamity. That's important. And in this world, today, we struggle with that too. After the 9-11 attacks on the Twin Towers, if you recall, two prominent Christian thinkers, one by the name of Jerry Falwell Jr. and another by the name of Pat Robertson, suggested that it was God's judgment. The outcry against that was so vehement, so vitriolic, so incensed with anger that these two Christians withdrew their statements. In old-fashioned language, they recanted. Why? Because the general consensus was that God can only bless America. You see, we refuse to accept that God can judge a nation. We refuse to accept that God can judge a planet. We don't know who God is. The God of popular religion is not necessarily holy. You see, as Job once said of God, when he had lost everything, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. It is this, precisely this, that shows us we have lost true understanding of who God is. Now Job, after years of suffering, hasn't heard from God, has argued with his friends about his innocence, and they're victimizing him and making him the scapegoat for his problems. God is silent. This God who is loving, this God who regards Job as the apple of his eye, keeps quiet. 
it is as if there is a boundary between Job and God, and Job is left to stew over his problems. Try and imagine it. You've lost your family, with the exception of your wife. You have lost all your possessions. You have lost your dignity in society. You scrape uh, scabs off your body with pieces of pottery. The children take a wide arc around you because of the stench. You live in the rubbish dump. Your friends castigate you. You are told that you are to blame. And God is silent. Yet you've been obedient. You've been a good servant. You have adhered to the law. And this God, who has brought calamity on your head, is silent. Well, God remains silent. But then, in Job chapter 38, God finally speaks. After these men have exhausted themselves, with words, 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 meaningless pontifications, arguing back and forth about Job's innocence or lack thereof. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding, who determined its measurements? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fastened, or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Job 38, 1-7. What's interesting is that God immediately implodes their one-dimensional view of life. Their frames of reference are shattered by this announcement. He stretches their knowledge beyond the capacity to comprehend. Sentences or questions like, words without knowledge? They don't have the conceptual apparatus to understand him. That's because we don't naturally comprehend the attributes I referred to earlier. God's aseity, God's immutability, these are all alien to us. We think in terms of our own situation. We are our own reference point. The historian Arnold Toynbee said that this civilization is the first of 21 civilizations that considers itself inwardly its own reference point. Every other civilization, Christian or not, looked outwards. Then what about growth as Christians? Those of us who have been enlightened, those of us who have the Holy Spirit, those of us who have the fellowship of the saints and the sacraments to grow. What about our growth? Notice that God goes directly to the doctrine of creation. This is fascinating. It's not salvation. It's creation. This doctrine establishes the fundamentals first and foremost. In fact, the historian Paul Johnson gets it wrong when he says, this part of Job is possibly not authored by whoever authored Job because it's such a poor answer. But he doesn't get it. God goes directly to the doctrine of creation. The fact that creation is dependent on him for its existence. I find as a Christian, my understanding of the doctrine of creation gets stronger every day. In fact, I am removed further and further and further from the world's answer to existence than before. I now look on theories of evolution and biogenesis and the creation or the establishment of something from nothing 
with incredulity. It is an impossibility to me. They speak about time plus matter plus chance. Aristotle said, even he as a non-Christian said, chance is something rocks dream about. It's nothing. Yet when I look around me and I see creation, I'm reminded every day of God's creation, of the fact that God is sovereign. Think about it. What they are suggesting is absolute nonsense. Their minds are darkened. And this proves several things. It proves firstly that the so-called esoteric knowledge doesn't do anything for a man or a woman's soul. Nothing. They can sound as erudite as they want, but it's absolute rubbish. In the words of Malcolm Muggeridge, the great Christian philosopher, they've educated themselves into imbecility. No, there's something more important than intelligence. It is obedience and our spiritual state. We are tempted to think that given the right amount of intelligence, the obvious value of the gospel, the remarkable testimony to Jesus' life, the 3,500 manuscripts testifying to his existence and death, the fact that most records were written within 150 years of his life, some within living memory, we tempted to think that pure intelligence would at least understand the credibility of such an account. But no, they don't. They would rather resort to what we consider to be ridiculous. And then there's Pascal's wager. Blaise Pascal, the French philosopher, said, he argued that a rational person should live as though God exists and seek to believe in God. If God does not actually exist, such a person will have only a finite loss, some pleasures and luxury, etc., Whereas if God does exist, he stands to receive infinite gains, such as, for example, eternity in heaven, and avoid infinite losses. Even if, you would think, even if they had in the back of their minds the notion that God doesn't exist, they would live as if he did. But no, they don't. They reject God. That's because the human condition is one that is so deep, so endemic, so cataclysmic that we have no notion of who God is. It is best to give God the glory, no matter what your circumstances. We are so obsessed with our own agendas, with our own needs. The reference point is us. That's not the way it should be. And even though Job was considered righteous, it's exactly what he needed to learn. That's why God says, stand up like a man and listen to me. It's what Job needed to learn. Even in his so-called righteous state, he was making himself the point of reference. He had forgotten God's preeminence. After God's monologue, Job expresses contrition. It says, Job answered the Lord and said, I know that you can do everything, that no purpose of yours can be withheld from you. You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me which I did not know. Listen, please, and let me speak. You said, I will question you, and you shall answer me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes, language that is the laughing stock of the world today. Repent, dust and ashes. But this is the attitude of Job after he realizes what he has said. My experience has been, what limited experience I have had, is that this is where God wants us. This is where God wants us. And sometimes it takes much pain to get there. Because we are likely 
to go our own way. It's our natural bent. Bringing us down to earth is a painful experience, but it is a necessary one. We become too conceited, too proud, too easily. I'm speaking here to Christians. I'm not speaking to nominal Christians. I'm talking now about those who would live in the world and be happy with the world, but keep one foot in church just to keep some kind of insurance. Christians who would get themselves into a position where they are self-reliant. We need to keep ourselves contrite and to give God glory at all times. And even when things don't work out our way, it's a slog to get there, but it's necessary. We become too full of ourselves and become something that gets in the way of our fellowship with God. And the church is so weak. And I'm talking about the Christian church now. Clearly, we have to distinguish between that which is evangelical and that which isn't, between that which is Protestant and that which isn't. But generally speaking, the church is so weak. Regarding the point I made earlier about Pat Robinson and Jerry, Jerry Falwell Jr., their decision to recant on their view is the norm nowadays. This is in times of mild persecution. We haven't had as much religious freedom ever in our history as we have now. What happens if we had to face the persecution that Tyndale, Wycliffe, or Cranmer, or even Luther and Calvin, or Huss had to face? What then? What do we lose now? Our YouTube channel? Our job opportunity? Our financial prospects, our personal peace and affluence, it's nothing. John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress in jail because he was a Christian. A time of sifting will come. The church will be sifted. And the reason the church needs to be sifted is because it's lost its vision and understanding of the nature of God. I suggested to a friend the other day that God's current, that the current pandemic, the contagion we are experiencing, might well be an indication of God's judgment. And he was horrified. He said, no, I shouldn't. He said, just preaching the gospel is enough to bring people to conviction of sin. And by that, I'm sure he meant just preaching that Jesus loves them. Really? The church has been preaching that for so long. That it's now a given amongst the secular man. No, well, Jesus loves me anyway. The fact that Jesus loves us is all the more remarkable in the light of our condition. That's why his love is remarkable. The fact that God came and lived amongst us is all the more remarkable given the attributes I mentioned the aseity of God, the omnipotence of God. Philippians chapter 2 is very clear. He gave it up to be amongst us. That should be remarkable. That should be mind-blowing. But it is no longer. It's almost as if God owes us. Then I want to speak a little bit about the new gospel. You see, what Satan will do is that he will create facsimiles of the gospel, but there will be a twist and a bend. It will have the look of the gospel. It will have the feel of the gospel. But if you look at its detail, it's a wicked lie. I want to talk about the gospel of woke. What do I mean by woke? Woke is defined as and this is where we have to be careful, because some elements of this are necessary. But the lie is in the detail. Work is defined as actively aware of the systemic, there's a bit of detail for you, injustices and prejudices, especially those related to civil and human rights. Now, being aware of injustice and fighting injustice is commendable. 
The Christians have a wonderful legacy of this. William Wilberforce, for example. Okay. These are people who fought injustice, and so they should have. The Old Testament prophets preached against injustice. But the problem is that injustice is now defined in a different way. Firstly, we are bullied by the world. The world has its own morality, strangely enough, a warped version of original and earlier Christian values. But now the world is the bully. The church has to come online by engaging in what is known as identity politics. This means entire groups now have to feel guilty by virtue of their ethnicity and also feel victimized. People are judged by the group, not as individuals. Secondly, there is a false guilt that is developed, not a guilt based on transgression of God's law. No. It's a guilt that is based on transgression of a new law, political correctness. Thirdly, notice that the emphasis is now off salvation of souls for eternity. It is on the establishment of justice for this life. Now, of course, in the advance of the gospel in glorious times in the past, great things have happened in this world as a result of the preaching of the gospel. But the priority was right. When Wesley and Whitfield preached about regeneration of souls, and it said that Whitfield preached, you must be born again more than 3,000 times, the world around them changed. When Jonathan Edwards preached sinners in the hands of an angry God, the world around him changed, but the priority was right. It's not like that anymore. But the church's fight for justice should be based on biblical doctrines, like, for example, man being created in the image of God. Otherwise, it holds no water. The modern gospel of work doesn't have a regard for the truths of God's word. It's all about our rights. But finally, we as Christians should be awaiting a coming kingdom. We have the Spirit as a down payment and a seal guaranteeing the inheritance to come. I'm pretty sure Job had a good sense of eternity after his trials. Consider the following passage that Paul writes to the Ephesians. In him we have the redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made, no, made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be to the praise of his glory. In him also you trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Ephesians 1, 7 to 14. I don't hear debates about uh, these issues. Even if there's disagreement. I hear debates about um, tattoos. I hear debates about um, social justice. I hear debates as important as it is about homosexuality and abortion, as important as they are. But those are issues that come second to this. I don't hear Christians thinking and talking about these things. These are the things that should season our conversation. These are the things that should make us get up in the morning. These are the things that should make us want to serve God day after day after day. Predestination is a is a filthy word nowadays. This should give us hope. The fact that God predestined us 
according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. His decorative will, his, uh, his great decrees, his plan for our lives. No, these things are gone. And so the time has come for us to focus once again on God and his nature. And what a wonderful, wonderful message we have that God in and of himself, he gave up in Jesus. He gave up what he had and came and lived amongst us. Not only did he live the perfect life, but he died the perfect death. He died in our place so that we may have access to God in the Holy of Holies. The curtain has been torn. We have access. The scriptures say we may come before him with boldness. That is, in the light of what I mentioned earlier about God, that is incredible. With boldness. Not cockiness. Boldness. That we may bring the promises of his covenant before him. That we may rely on what he has given us. That as God has said, we may sit and reason together. This is what we should be praising him for. And this is what we should be living in the light of. Let us remember that this God has gone so far for us. and We should be constrained to serve him. And let us take a stand knowing that tough times are coming. Let us also know and understand that God is in control. How can we even believe that he isn't? There's a new theology that has been developed. It's called open theism. It's almost like God doesn't know what's going to happen. He's just with us on the journey and he's helping us uh, accommodate the journey. No. God is in control, complete control. Try and imagine a world where God isn't in control. I spoke earlier of 9-11. People say, where was God on 9-11? Can you imagine a world where there was no God and there was a 9-11? That is a frightening world. We have hope, we have purpose, and we have everything to be encouraged about, no matter what our conditions. Amen. So this